the Dictionary People, the unsung heroes who created the Oxford English Dictionary, written by Sarah Oglevy and published by Alfred A. Knopf in October of 2023, with a snippet read by Richard Coombs. Available for checkout right now at the Alice Pendleton Library. It was in a hidden corner of the Oxford University Press basement where the dictionary's archive is stored that I opened a dusty box and came across a small black book tied with cream ribbon. The basement archive is, strangely perhaps, one of my favorite places in the world. Silent, cold, musty-smelling, rows of movable steel shelves on rollers, brown, acid-free boxes bulging with letters, millions of slips of paper tied in bundles with twine, and dictionary proofs covered in small, precise handwriting. It is a place full of friendly, word-nerd ghosts. Perhaps those ghosts were guiding me because the discovery I made that day would lead me on an extraordinary journey and eventually to the book you are now holding. I was there out of nostalgia, more than anything. I used to work upstairs as an editor on the Oxford English Dictionary, OED, and I was filling in time while waiting for my visa to come through for a new job in America. It was Friday, and I had spent the whole week revisiting my favorite spots before leaving the city that had been my home for 14 years. Monday had been a walk around the Deer Park, within the walls of Magdalen College. C.S. Lewis had said that the circular path was the perfect length for any problem. It was true. The fertilaria weren't in flower, but the trees were yellow, and the leaves on the ground were damp and smelled of the earth. Next, noisy Longwall Street and past the dirty windows of where I used to live at number 13. Through a heavy gate and an arch in the old city wall and onto the vast gardens of New College, with its immaculate lawn and long border still in color, the bells rang as I paused at the spot under the oak where the college cat Montgomery had been buried by the chaplain. Along the gravel path by the purple echinops, crimson dahlias, and red echinacea were the pom-pom centers. Through the grand gates of the old quad and into the silence of the cloisters where they had filmed Harry Potter, I pushed open the door of the chapel and was immediately hit by the comforting smell of beeswax and the sound of the choir boys rehearsing. I stayed in the antechapel and sat in front of Epstein's Lazarus, rising out of the tomb and spinning free of his bandages. Tuesday was the upper reading room of the Bodleian Library. Wednesday was the secret bench against the President's Wall at Trinity College, where I used to worry about my thesis. Thursday was Wolvercote Cemetery and the resting place of my hero, James Murray, the longest-serving editor of the Oxford English Dictionary from 1879 up to his death in 1915. The dictionary had started out with three men. Richard Chevenax Trench, the Dean of Westminster Abbey, along with Herbert Coleridge and Frederick Furnival, both lawyers turned literary scholars who suggested the creation of a new dictionary. Until then, the major English dictionaries, such as Dr. Samuel Johnson's in the 18th century, were prescriptive texts, telling their readers what words should mean and how they should be spelled, pronounced and used. In 1857, these men proposed to the London Philological Society, one of these scholarly societies that were such a hallmark of their day, the creation of an entirely new dictionary, no patch upon old garments but a new garment throughout. Coleridge became the first editor of the New English Dictionary, as the OED was first called, but he died two years into the job. Frederick and Furnival took over for 20 years until he was replaced in 1879 by a schoolmaster in London called James Augustus Henry Murray. Before moving to Oxford, Murray tried to combine teaching at Mill Hill School with work on the dictionary. The dictionary won out. It was at Mill Hill that Murray had started to compile the dictionary inside his house, but the vast quantities of books and slips threatened to crowd out his growing family. 
In time, he and his wife Ada would have 11 children. Ada eventually put her foot down, insisting that he build an iron shed in the garden and use that as his office. It was nicknamed the Scriptorium.